Okay, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Schifrin. I'm the Foreign Affairs and Defense Correspondent for PBS NewsHour, uh, and I am excited to talk about Afghanistan, a place very close to my heart, because I lived there for many years, and, and hopefully uh, close to a lot of people here uh, who care about policy and the future of the US and the region. Uh, and I am joined uh, by Ambassador Roya Rahmani, first female ambassador of Afghanistan to the US, former uh, first female ambassador of Afghanistan to Indonesia, uh, and before she entered government was a human rights uh, and women's empowerment advocate in Kabul. Uh, and Ambassador Doug Lute, uh, former U.S. permanent representative to NATO. Uh, 2007, President Bush uh, named him the war czar, as, as we called you back then. He didn't uh, actually say that. But. <laughs> well, we, we did. Um, uh, in char coordinating the, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, continued under President Obama when, when you and I first met, focused on Afghanistan and South Asia, uh, and as General Lute, uh, Director of Operations for CENTCOM, uh, as well as the Joint Staff. Uh, and so quickly, if I could just do a, a scene setter for Afghanistan, we're on our seventh round of talks between the United States, led by Ambassador Khalilzad uh, and the Taliban in Doha. Last week, we had our first intra-Afghan dialogue between the Taliban and members of the Afghan government, including, uh, or, or in addition to other uh, Afghans not in the government. Uh, the US is negotiating on four subjects, counterterrorism, troop withdrawal, intra-Afghan dialogue, and a ceasefire, uh, and we'll get to all of that. Uh, in the meantime, U.S. military is taking a very active role targeting Taliban leaders uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and civilians, as always, are paying the price. 3,800 died last year more than any uh, other time, or, or higher than any other U.N. number. Um, and uh, we have about 13, 14,000 U.S. troops uh, in Afghanistan, spending 50 billion uh, a year or so still, uh, and uh, looming over all of this are two dates of the next couple months, elections. Uh, President Ashraf Ghani um, is running for re-election in September, and the United States has set a deadline for at least a, a preliminary peace deal in September. So a lot going on, uh, and not, not a lot of time to do it. Uh, so Ambassador Rahmani, if I, if I could start with you, and, and let's, before we go into the specifics of the peace negotiations, I want to talk about U.S.-Afghan relations. Uh, about four months ago, I was in your embassy in, in Kabul, right. uh, and your predecessor, Ambassador uh, Mohib, the current National Security Advisor, uh, basically did a diplomatic destruction uh, of Zalmay Khalilzad, basically saying that he wanted to create a caretaker government and then become the viceroy of Afghanistan. We've heard some nicer month, uh, words in the last four months, but today, does the Afghan government, does President Ashraf Ghani trust Zalmay Khalilzad in the process he is leading? Thank you, Nick. America and Afghanistan are foundational partners. This is how we have been terming it and using it and meaning it. United States has contributed immensely to reconstruction of Afghanistan in uh, terms of blood and treasure, and we are extremely grateful of that. I cannot start a talk without expressing our gratitude for everything that the American has done in the past 18 years. Well, in terms of our relationship, of course, when you are working so closely, there could be ups and downs. Um, our government, of course, has our national interest in heart, and your government, the same. There has been ups and downs, but the reality is that this relationship matters the most. It's more important than many other things that are based on relations and uh, how we come across, or sometimes we, we may have quarrels and whatnot. Um, I can assure you that uh, the relationship is good. We have a friendly relationship. We rely on one another. And we are looking forward to much more to come. Does the Afghan government trust the process that Zalmay Khalilzad is leading? We are continuously discussing and uh, talking to one another, we, we express our concern when we have concerns, and uh, we are hoping that they are taken into consideration because a peace deal 
is only going to be durable and sustainable if it's owned by the Afghans. Hmm. So uh, there is one larger, one other big, large question I want to ask you before we turn to some of the specifics in the peace agreement. Uh, and I've talked to a handful of people in the last a uh, few days, both in Kabul and, and in Washington and in the US. Uh, and they are, many express a concern about the elections and a concern that President uh, Ashraf Ghani uh, will make sure that it's legitimate. So to this room that wants this election to proceed uh, and succeed, what can you reassure us that Ashraf Ghani is doing to make sure uh, that, that this election is legitimate, and, and I will have you respond to some of the criticisms mm -hmm. uh, of him, which is that he's politicizing his office, mm -hmm. um, stacking local police chiefs in his favor, which is what you do in order to make sure election day goes well. Uh, and so, um, bottom line, do you believe that this government is committed to making sure that this election is legitimate, and does Ashraf Ghani want to win the election more than he wants the U.S. to find peace with the Taliban? There was a lot of questions you asked. <laughs> Just, two. Question. Just two. Just <laughs> two. Uh, elections are imperative. We are going to do everything we can to hold a fair and free election. Why is that? Because elections means continuity. And continuity means stability. In my lifetime, I have seen enough of the regime changes in the ways that has been pretty destructive. Well, of course, there was one time that continuity was not a good thing to continue. Mm -hmm. And that is when after 9-11 and the 2001, which uh, really uh, was a statement of war, but for us, it meant peace. Uh, so we will do everything to hold a fair and free election. Um, in the run-up to that, we have made all the necessary preparations. The ballot has been uh, printed. The top-up registration has been completed. The budget has been finalized. The operational plan is in place. And of course, with the support of international, our international allies, we are hoping to hold the election on time. This is imperative also for peace to happen. It's not an alternative. It's a complementary part of the peace process. Should we uh, have, uh, and, and I hope that we will have a peace deal soon, who is going to implement it? A peace deal is the first step. But the reality of implementation of a peace process would only occur or happen once uh, when, when you have a reliable partner and a, uh, an implementing um, um, possibility, and that is only a strong and central government that will make sure that the people's confidence is secured, that will propel people <coughs> towards hope and um, uh, progress as, as, the, as the peace process unfolds, uh, to ensure that they uh, receive and have access to the all so, uh, relevant services that they need. That's the work of a government. And the and uh, uh, legitimate, strong government needs to be in place for the peace to succeed. The last two presidential elections, with all due respect, have not produced that obviously legitimate, strong government. Why should we think that this election would? Uh, <clears throat> democracies are not easy. I think we all or at least some of us might agree with that. We have a very nascent democracy. 2014 was a landmark event when for the very first time, Afghanistan had transfer of power from one legitimate government, from one elected government to another. It never happened in our history. And we have 5,000 years of history behind us. So that, uh, of course, it's not at the same level and um, uh, may not respond to all our expectations. But despite all the fact that the, uh, Afghan uh, the people of Afghanistan have demonstrated their resolve to a republic system, to democracy, I don't think anybody can challenge that. We have shown <coughs> and demonstrated with a lot of resilience how much we want 
democracy to continue. You, uh, you know very well that uh, last October we held our parliamentary elections. It took months to wrap it up. In fact, after it was wrapped up and, and announced, they had quarrels for a month over the Speaker of the House. But once they finalized the election, the Speaker of the House was elected. It's his contestant held his hand, lead him to, to the chair of the Speaker, and congratulated him. It might not be the same way that we expect, but it happens. It was despite all the odds. A lot of people said it's impossible to hold a, a parliamentary election, but we succeeded. Let's not forget, all of these practices, everything we are doing is only 18 years. So we have full confidence that it will happen. Ambassador Lute, you know better than uh, most people here that some of the problems are not about inside Afghanistan at all over the last 18 years, but inside the US government and, and the policy making process. So, so let's talk about two things. One is um, the relationship between the military uh, and the diplomats. Uh, and then let's talk about some of the specifics uh, in this peace deal. Uh, so in terms of the first one, the military and the diplomats, uh, let me read you what uh, General Mark Milley, the next chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, said a few weeks ago, I think pulling out prematurely would be a strategic mistake. It's slow, it's painful, it's hard. I spent a lot of my life in Afghanistan, but I also think it's necessary. Secretary Pompeo, however, has said that we need a peace deal or some kind of framework by September the 1st. You have seen some real conflicts over Afghanistan between the State Department and the military. Today, is there still a conflict between the military and the State Department over Afghanistan? Well, just to Mark Milley's point, it doesn't seem to me that 18 years is premature, so I think <laughs> there's a point to discuss there. Um, one thing is very different today uh, in the bureaucratic set that Zal Khalazad is dealing with inside the U.S. government is that unlike 10 years ago, where we began to talk to the Taliban, today you really have a quite unified position across the bureaucracies in Washington. So our military uh, now states that uh, there is no hope for a military outcome, a favorable military outcome in Afghanistan. And in effect, the security situation on the ground is a stalemate. That's new. Uh, we didn't have that when we started 10 years ago. And frankly, we spent a lot of time and sort of policy bandwidth talking to ourselves about should we prioritize the military effort uh, or is there an opening, is there a reasonable opening for diplomacy? I think we're past that. And, and I think one reason that Zal is making some progress is the fact that we're now speaking much more with one voice. And you're saying we weren't past that in we 2009, weren't. No, we weren't. When, when, we still, we imagined 2009 when President Obama sent an additional 40,000 U.S. troops, which topped us off at 100,000 U.S. troops. Um, we still imagined that, at least some of us imagined, that there was a military solution. Hmm. And, that, and that, of course, impeded diplomacy, right? So, so why would we negotiate? Why would we compromise if we think we can win? So you, you brought it up, and, and former member of the military, former person uh, inside the White House National Security Council staff trying to figure this out. What you just said, I think, actually might surprise some people in this room. Do you believe that the military leadership is wrong or uh, doesn't quite understand uh, the dynamics of Afghanistan when it says that it has to stay and that a precipitous withdrawal uh, would be a bad uh, mistake? Well, again, it's you know precipitous and you know premature. That don't to my to my eyes uh, match 18 years, but I, I do think that this this they have to understand right that we've tried one approach, in fact, with several variants for 18 years. Uh, my counter argument to Mark Milley, who has spent considerable time in the combat zone as a soldier, right? My argument back to him was. At what point is for, you know, to, to commit as much as it takes for as long as it takes, at what point is that not a productive approach? And, and I think the, the reality today is we have another approach. We have an approach if we prioritize the diplomacy of this. We have a possibility, and, and we'll talk, I'm sure, here in the panel, it's not going to be easy. This is a, here we are surrounded by mountains. This is a pretty steep mountain, Zal Khalazad's trying to climb, right? But it's an approach that is worth trying because what we've been doing for 18 years 
has not been successful. But, but just to put a point on it, do you believe that the argument that Afghanistan would become a safe haven for terrorists again if the U.S. leave is, is wrong? And do you believe the U.S. can have the strike capacity inside Afghanistan even if it left? So the counterterrorism argument, or the safe haven argument, this is if we leave, Al-Qaeda will return, and this will be like 2001. Uh, I'm actually skeptical of that argument uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, there's any number of other places around the world that offer perhaps a more attractive safe haven opportunity for transnational terrorists than Afghanistan. Um, second of all, Al-Qaeda today is not Al-Qaeda of 2001. It's decimated. Um, it's not eliminated, but it's much diminished. And frankly, Afghanistan in 2019 is not Afghanistan of 2001. So there are a lot of reasons that I think the safe haven argument isn't, uh, isn't fully justified. You know, look, as Americans, we ought to look in the mirror here. You know, we, the shorthand, the folklore here, the shorthand story is that bin Laden was, in fact, in Afghanistan on September 11, 2001. But the plot for, for uh, the attack on America was hatched by Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Karachi, right? Uh, Mohammed Atta created the cell of attackers in Hamburg, Germany. And the guys who hijacked the airplanes got flight training in Florida and Arizona. We didn't occupy any of those places, okay? So the notion that we somehow have to occupy Afghanistan or sustain it indefinitely with as much as it takes for as long as it takes, I don't think that passes muster on the safe haven argument. And Ambassador Rahmani, does that concern you? If, if someone like Ambassador Lude, who clearly cares so much about Afghanistan, argues that maybe the United States does not have to be there in the long term? <clears throat> well, um, all conflicts must end with a political solution. We know that. Uh, however, how we are going to reach that political solution matters the most, whether it will be sustainable or not. The reality is that uh, it is the environment of fear and oppression where extremism and terrorism thrive. That was the environment that was provided, for, and uh, as Ambassador Lute uh, referred to, that basically made a safe haven for those activities uh, to be conducted or um, organized or housed in Afghanistan. So. But could that safe haven be created again if the U.S. were to withdraw either to zero or close to zero? Uh, well, he, again, it, it totally depends on the approach of how we are going to do that. Um, what I mean by that is let's not forget that the withdrawal of the foreign forces really happened in 2014 where the number of foreign troops went to a, uh, from a, uh, over 150,000 to 14,000, uh, finally, that, 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 to now, and now uh, something around 16,000 that it is currently today. Right now, the fight against terrorism is conducted by our forces. Uh, the United States and our NATO, the NATO allies are providing the, an assisting and training mission. Where they support us the most is with the airlift and intelligence. Mm. And we are still in the forefront of a fight against terrorism. Let's not forget, it's not only the Taliban that we are fighting. There is over 20 different transnational terrorist organizations that our uh, troops are fighting on an everyday basis. Uh, as early as January this year, the government of Afghanistan, in fact, put a, pl a plan and called uh, for a reassessment of the engagement, uh, the military engagement of the foreign forces. So if we need to make adjustments uh, of the number of troops, or you want to reduce them, it is possible and doable. And we can work with you again, as we have done over the past 18 years, uh, to be your ally in the fight against terrorism to bring those numbers down. It, but of course, if, if this, this whole thing would turn to a um, uh, set up where Taliban would come and take over, I'm not so sure, I'm not very hopeful. Let's talk about the specifics of the peace negotiations. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, 
four aspects. So counterterrorism, this is basically getting the Taliban to renounce al-Qaeda and some version of the Taliban committing to go after not only al-Qaeda, uh, but uh, ISIS and, and other transnational terrorism groups. Troop withdrawal, that's, that's pretty obvious. Intra-Afghan dialogue, which I want to ask about. And then permanent and comprehensive ceasefire. So, uh, Doug, let's, let's start with the last one. Permanent and comprehensive ceasefire. Does the U.S. right now really have leverage over the Taliban to get the Taliban to stop any of its violence and to convince the Taliban to commit to a ceasefire that the Taliban itself says uh, would actually damage their abilities uh, and their support across the country? Do we have that leverage? Um, I don't see it, frankly. Um, I, I think that there are things the Taliban want out of this conversation. Um, most important, I mean, their war aim is one of the other provisions you mentioned, that the withdrawal of foreign forces, right? Uh, and their, their jihad against foreign occupation is the cohesive, it's the glue that keeps the Taliban glued mm -hmm. together, right? Mm -hmm. So for them to sacrifice uh, on that front and permit some residual foreign presence, right, would actually be a bit of an existential threat to the movement itself. So given that, I don't think there's much room for us to argue for a residual force. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to abandon Afghanistan. I mean, there, there are ways today that we didn't have in 2001. There are ways today to sustain a CT capacity in Afghanistan that even if al-Qaeda or the Islamic State were to spring up, we can respond in meaningful time frames. Um, so, um, I don't, Zhao doesn't have a lot of leverage. I mean, he doesn't. It's a tough, tough, um, it's a tough, tough role. The one thing I think that is different, though, today, is that all the parties to the conflict seem to be uh, reaching common ground on the understanding that there's no military solution. Uh, I mean, we mentioned earlier, that's new to us here in the U.S., um, but increasingly, I think, the Afghan government uh, and the Taliban, and frankly, regional players, uh, have come to the conclusion now after 18 long years that this is not going to be won on the ground militarily. So there is some common ground. Uh, the Taliban also have suggested in some of their public statements and so forth that they s at least somewhat understand that Afghanistan today is not the Afghanistan that they ruled um, 18 years ago. Uh, and the fact that we have the ambassador here uh, is symbolic of the increased role of civil society in Afghanistan, uh, the increased role of women, the increased role uh, of uh, ethnic minorities, uh, and so forth, uh, but mass communications, uh, emerging democratic institutions, still nascent, as, as the ambassador said. This is a different Afghanistan. And, and my sense is the, the Taliban understand that, at least to some extent. Ambassador, this is a different Afghanistan. Do we have a different Taliban? That's a, that's a, that's a very important question. I haven't met with them. But, so I have to base my question on the following. A, on what I hear they say. B, on what I see they do. So in the uh, battlefield, it doesn't seem that they have changed. Last night, 9 p.m. Aspen time, there was a big explosion at the Kabul University. Mm. 10 killed, 30 wounded. Taliban said they didn't do it. So if the Taliban didn't do it, then there is a lot more to negotiate with, a lot more groups, I mean. But of course, back in Afghanistan, it's believed, and also based on our, and the information our security forces have, it was the Taliban. Yesterday, there was a big attack on the headquarters of police in Kandahar, where they killed 11, 90 injured. Most of all of these people in both of these attacks are civilians. The um, killing of women for the accusation of adultery, um, the closure of 42 centers and Wardak province um, of, of healthcare facilities in Wardak province that was run by the Swedish committee and many more. 
I was going through the list of what has happened last July. There were dozens of these attacks. So that doesn't convince me very much, at least at the battlefield, that they have changed. So otherwise, politically, have they changed? OK, there was this uh, intra-Afghan dialogue. And in this dialogue, women also participated. Um, I don't know. Um, um, it, it was, of course, a positive step. It was, it was uh, a step forward. Um, I, given that it was in Doha, I don't know if, they, if it was in Afghanistan, it would have been the same. Um, so, uh, and the people who went to Doha, um, they gave me, their feedback was not uh, very positive. Let me, let me summarize it in the following way. If they have changed, this is what I heard from people who have met them. They might have changed for the Afghanistan of 96. Not enough for Afghanistan of 2019. Today, I don't, uh, um, I mentioned 65% of our population are under the age of 25. Our youth are aspiring to completely different lifestyle. They want democracy. They want sports. They want music. They are in all sorts of uh, professions. Again, thanks to our allies that helped us and provided these opportunities for us. But a young uh, population is also a restless population. So there is also um, difficulties attached to it. So the obvious question to me, therefore, is if the Taliban have not changed in terms of what they do in Afghanistan and who they target and how they target them. And if the Taliban have not changed politically when they speak to women in Doha, can you make a peace with a Taliban that hasn't changed? Well, um, again, as uh, we discussed here, we, the Afghan nation, wants peace more than anyone else. Uh, a peace negotiation uh, or any negotiation, as a matter of fact, is a matter of give and take. This is why it's important in the four elements that you discussed that Ambassador Khalilzad is pursuing in his talks, that there shouldn't be any precedence between these four elements uh, except for the ceasefire. Because ceasefire is, of course, something that we want. We wanted 40 years ago. But uh, if, if you were to negotiate a withdrawal and assurances of counterterrorism before they have a full dialogue with the Afghan government on the details of how they are going to be part of a power sharing system, how they are going to conduct what they need to do, how they are going to reintegrate as part of the society, I don't know they will enter the, the, that negotiation with a bargaining or a, a spirit of negotiation um, and make it successful. So, so Nick, if I could just come back. I don't think the question here is, have the Taliban changed, right? The question is, has Afghanistan changed? The Afghanistan of 1996 uh, to 2001, when the Taliban ruled, was an Afghanistan coming out of a decade of Soviet occupation, followed by the meltdown of the government when the Soviets left, followed by civil war, right? Those circumstances are the circumstances that led to the Taliban ruling for five years. Um, and that's not the Afghanistan we have today. Now, the, you know, there may be, there may well be Taliban leaders who still aspire to the good old days uh, when they were in power. My argument is that that's not, that's not the, those conditions are not in place today in Afghanistan, largely because of all the advances over the last 18 years. So in a way, we have bought some insurance against a return to the Taliban because of the advances that the ambassador has cited. Now, the other thing I want to just highlight here is this is not, this is, none of this suggests this is going to be easy. Uh, in fact, it may not be possible. Uh, but I think the argument that I, you know, I'd like to communicate to the Aspen community today is that, is that this is the best chance we've had in 10 years. It may still be impossible. But the combination of changed circumstances, uh, the fact that we've got an ace diplomat in Zalmay Khalazad, an Afghan American, speaks the language, knows all the players. So he goes to speak to the Taliban. He's speaking in Pashto. Um, so th th this is an opportunity that we have, and we should prioritize it. 
because just doing more of the same indefinitely isn't very promising. Ambassador, do you agree with Ambassador Lutz's first point that, that the Afghan uh, society, the government, the military have really come far enough so that there's no existential threat posed by the Taliban to those uh, bits of progress that you've cited? Well, as long as we have continuity, we have a democracy, uh, our democracy uh, preserved and sustained, we have a system of republic, of course we will continue and even if need be, we will fight for it. This is what we have done all the uh, years along. So of course, uh, and we are open for the Taliban to be reintegrated. Our uh, people have uh, demonstrated their greatness and have uh, basically expressed that, that they are uh, willing to reintegrate the Taliban as long as they will become part of the system. But if they want to go back and change uh, uh, our system to as Emirates, that's not, that's not going to hold. Um, I only have time for one more question, then we'll open it up. Um, Ambassador Lut, uh, it seems that for uh, Zalmi Khalilzad to succeed, he needs to know his internal red lines, how far he can go and, and how far he might not be able to go. Is, are his bosses, is this administration capable of giving him those red lines and providing him some flexibility that he's going to need on drawdown? So I think um, one of the old rules of diplomacy is a little ambiguity is a good thing, right? Um, you don't want, don't want your red lines defined too precisely. Uh, and, uh, but you need them internally, don't you? Well, you need them internally, but you know, we just heard, uh, I think, a pretty convincing uh, session with Susan Rice that described the, sort of the internal decision-making process today, and it's not very, it seems to me, disciplined, predictable. Um, or, in, in my judgment, effective. So I don't think Zal has precise marching orders. Um, he's a very talented diplomat. He will, in my estimate, take advantage of the fact that he's got some room. Um, but look, the realities that you set out early in your comments, the fact that you know, the peace process is overlaid in time on top of an Afghan political transition, hugely complicates. Zhao's position. The fact that, what, 16 months from now, we'll be in um, uh, uh, the height, or 12 months from now, we'll be in the height of our political campaign. So this is vastly complicated by those two political transitions that are in front of us. So uh, I, I, my guess is if, if Zhao had made it this week, he would, he would not describe any red lines. He's probably quite happy with a little ambiguity. <laughs> uh, OK, let's start with Kim Dozier, who I saw first. Over there and there. Hey, Kim Dozier, Daily Beast. Say that the withdrawal and CT agreement are negotiated first, and there's a slight but not complete drawdown of Western forces. And during the Afghan dialogue, Taliban violence continues, including some of the revenge killings that we've already seen directed at Afghan forces and Afghan leadership. What does the U.S. government do then? What does the Afghan government do then? And take that first. Um, sure. This is why I mentioned before that, and, and I have been mentioning this to the administration uh, many times too, that it's very important that there is no precedence between these four elements except for the ceasefire again. Uh, and the reason is the one that I just explained that you need the Taliban to come to the table with the spirit of negotiation. If you already gave them a statement of victory that they can announce, and as Ambassador uh, Lut before said, that they have been very consistent asking, we just want drawdown. We want uh, the foreign forces, uh, not drawdown, the withdrawal, the full withdrawal of the foreign forces. Mm. If, if they have that, it's not only for them, and in my humble view, really, it, it sends a statement to all the other uh, terrorist networks that persistence pays off. Mm. Uh, that, uh, that there is, uh, that, that there is uh, if, if um, they continue, uh, they, they, might, they might find victory. While I personally believe that uh, President Trump wants a deal but a good deal. 
And I have been assured of that many, many times by the administration. So what's a good deal? A good deal is the one that Afghanistan will no longer be your threat, but your ally. We will not be economically dependent on you, but be your partner. It will not be a lost cause, but a badge of victory on the shoulder of every man and woman who served in Afghanistan. And that's all possible. I know we don't have much time, but I'm happy to the full length discuss how that could be possible. And what's a bad deal? A bad deal would be the one that a P, you, we will have a peace settlement, but it's not durable. So what would it result to? We have seen it. Afghanistan in the past 40 years have had many deals, many agreements, from Geneva to Mecca, you name it. The, the problem was it did not hold. Uh, a bad deal is the one that we cannot preserve the gains of the past 18 years, that we, our democracy cannot be pre preserved and protected. And, and the one that will not be uh, honoring to our shared fight against terrorism. So if I, if I could just come back, I think more likely, Kim, is not a, a, an arrangement, a final arrangement, where parts one and two are agreed and locked, and then we turn to parts three and four, so the intra-Afghan dialogue uh, and the ceasefire. But more likely is, a, is sort of a step-by-step -step approach, which by way of execution of the withdrawal, and by way of execution of the counterterrorism guarantees, a bit of trust and confidence is built up over time. And, and if that trust is violated, so if the Taliban violate the, um, the uh, counterterrorism provision, for example, then I think you, you, we'd, we'd be back to, we'd take a step back. We wouldn't just proceed you know, dutifully uh, down a path. Yeah, over here. Um, Leah Khan from the State Department. Ambassador Rahmani, I was wondering if you could speak to the future of women's rights in Afghanistan following the peace talks. It's a very good question. And uh, I was uh, many times asked about what I made out of the intra-Afghan dialogue where women were included. And I said it was an immense progress and very important, but not enough. Uh, Women's inclusion in the peace process is a means, not the end. Uh, women's rights will be only protected and preserved if we protect and preserve our constitution, our democracy, because it's the institutions that protect rights of women, not rhetoric. Uh, I'm sitting today here in front of you, and all of this has been made possible with our shared and joint efforts. Uh, I, this is a very small example of the changes, of the immense changes that has taken place in Afghanistan. Uh, we can give many, many examples of how far we have come. It doesn't, uh, probably you cannot see it from afar, uh, and you see usually the bad news, the, the incidences, the bombings, the violations, but there is a lot of good news. For five years of destruction, you need 30 years of reconstruction. In Afghanistan, we are having 18 years of reconstruction, and it's paying off. We have traversed a very steep curve, and we have come a long way. So we are hoping that by securing our system, uh, that we all uh, have commitment and resolve to, uh, we will be able to preserve uh, the uh, right, the civil rights and liberties that we are committed to, including women's rights. All right, so uh, we only have time for, so one question here, sir, and then if you could just wait on the answers, and then Chris Eichen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a great dialogue. Uh, your neighbor, Pakistan, hasn't come up. <laughs> And Pakistan, most would say, have pl Pakistanis have played less than a helpful role mm -hmm. over these last almost 20 years. Will Pakistan remain part of the problem? And what should Pakistan do to become part of the solution? 
Okay, and let's get Chris's question, and then we'll... Well, he, he actually stole my question. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I, w I would just add to that. We, we have a new prime minister in Pakistan, Imran Khan, who's visiting uh, the White House uh, on Sunday and Monday. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could specifically address whether you've seen any changes in policy since uh, uh, um, since uh, Imran Khan has become prime minister. And he, he did, they did arrest Hafiz Saeed, who's a very prominent uh, militant leader, the other day. Uh, we'll see if he stays arrested, but that was yeah. a good mm -hmm. sign. Exactly. Um, but, but anyway, I'd be interested in that comment. All right, so quickly, Ambassador Lute, why don't you take the, is Pakistan one of the, if not still, the main problem? So I don't think the war in Afghanistan is fundamentally caused by Pakistan. However, Pakistan undeniably has a role. It is among the regional neighbors, right? It is the most important regional player, and that's because Afghanistan and Pakistan share the Pashtun population. There are actually more Pashtuns in Pakistan than there are in Afghanistan. Um, and the Taliban leadership, since they were evicted from uh, Afghanistan by our forces in 2001, went to Pakistan to live among their fellow Pashtuns. The leadership today is in the Pakistani city of Quetta. I mean, it's called the Quetta Shura for a reason, right? And Quetta is a city in Pakistan. Its counterpart in the east is the Peshawar Shura. Peshawar is a city in Pakistan. So there's no question here that Pakistan plays a big role and I think is probably the most significant potential spoiler in, on the regional set. So on top of everything we've talked about here, laying out the complexity of Zal's job, there's a regional dimension to this, which your question highlights, which we really haven't touched on. But this is a multi-layered uh, chessboard uh, that Zal Khalazad is trying to, trying to play. Quickly, Ambassador Rahmani, have you seen any difference in Pakistan playing that spoiler role since Imran Khan, a very different figure, a populist, and yet still backed by the military and the ISI? Have you seen any difference in Pakistani behavior? Um, I, I, it, it's a very important question. First of all, let, let me just uh, respond to what Ambassador Lutz said. Um, what I knew, uh, the Pakistan, uh, the Taliban leadership did not flee after the after 2001 to Pakistan. They were they were formed there. Um, number one. Number two is that uh, in the peace negotiations, the elements that, that you pointed out, uh, these, the, the very important element that is missing is Taliban's relationship with the regional actors, specifically with Pakistan. That's not something that is that's, uh, included in this, these four elements. And in addition to that, their relationship with the drug cartels and the narco industry, which is fueling the terrorism in the region. And, and it, the, the fingers of the, of the narco traffickers really stretch to the, to, to the bedrooms, whether in Europe or in, in United States. So these are other elements for, uh, for peace in Afghanistan to find its way that need to be considered and discussed. Whether they have changed, uh, of course there is uh, some positive movement, but actions are still re uh, remaining to be seen. Let me just also add this, that the, that the, uh, the attack in Kandahar that, that, that took place, there is evidence that it was planned and managed in Pakistan in Chaman. That happened in the last 24 hours. What's that positive movement, just very quickly? Just so we, well, uh, th there has been promises for the uh, cooperation. We've seen those before though, right? I have. So if you searched hard for an element of uh, optimism here, right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, the only one I can think of off the top of my head with regard to Pakistan is is the release of uh, Mullah Baradar, who was Omar's deputy and one of the founding figures of the Taliban movement itself, from Pakistani custody. And he's now leading the Taliban political commission in Doha. Uh, and I, I don't think he's a great diplomat. I'm not offering that. But what that did was remove the question mark about the credibility of the Doha political commission and its connection to the senior leadership. And that would not have happened without Pakistan seeing it in Pakistan's interest. So there's something there with regard to the broader play, which causes me to think this may be slightly different 
in terms of internal Pakistani politics. Although, of course, there's a debate about why Pakistan did that. Yeah, there As is. Benazir Bhutto said, Pakistan, there were no straight lines, only circles within circles. Right. So right. how about we end there? Anyway, thank you so much uh, for all your participation, questions, and Ambassador Ruth, Ambassador Mahani, thank you very much. We are taking a break.